interesting, or we say, no, God has spoken to us, it's more than interesting. It's a changing time and point and moment in our lives. And I'd like to ask that of you and me together, as Nehemiah called the people of Jerusalem together, and they looked at the wall, and they said, the wall is done, now what? As Kim so ably gave to us a moment ago in his uh, monologue, now what? And they read the law of God, they read the words, and the people were cut to their hearts. And in a few minutes that I have today, I would like to share something unique that happened at this point. It almost goes unnoticed when you read it, but it's the heart and the core of this passage. You see, they've been through every kind of struggle that there is, and many of us have been too. They've been through the political struggle. They had to fight their way through the bureaucratic challenges of Artaxerxes and letters of introduction and permission to go here and there, take troops with them, gather materials to build a wall. They had administrative things, and SUMC has administrative things that we have to battle our way through sometimes, don't we? But that's not what builds the people. They had to get through the competition. There were groups of people, you read about, uh, we read about them last week in chapter three. This group built one wall and some poor guys had to rebuild the dung wall, what a deal that was. Others got to rebuild the pool of Siloam, they're swimming in the afternoon while the other guys, I mean, it's just not fair. There had to be competition and there was competition. There was isolation. Only Nehemiah really understood what God called him to at first. He had to explain the entire city but it's not a matter of communication that builds a, a wall or a people. It's not a matter of putting an end to the competition that put, builds a wall or a people. It's not money that builds a wall or a people. And if you read the sections of Nehemiah, you'll see they, they had money. Some were mortgaging their farms to pay for the wall. Very expensive to build this huge wall. But somebody made the sacrifice, and some made too much, and some not enough. And they had to fight their way through that, but that's not what builds a people. Yeah. There was justice. The poor people were overlooked. The out-of-towners were overlooked. The ethnically mixed group was maybe overlooked sometimes. They had to get their justice in order. But that's not what builds a people. At a class divide, they had the city people, they had the urban people, you know how that goes. Urban people, no, they're not quite as good as the rest. <laughs> a little humor there. But there was a class divide, rich, poor, city, non-city. And then there were just the plain old enemies, Sanballat and Tobiah, constantly harassing them making their lives miserable. So they had to keep soldiers on duty while they built the wall. How would you like to build a wall with, with, with your six gun at your side? It wasn't any fun. But they overcame all that. They still were not ready. God wasn't done with them yet. You could think that it would be over. The walls would be good because Nehemiah prayed, God, build the walls. And that was the answer to the prayer. But you know what? God wasn't done with the people of Israel yet. And I'd like to suggest that if our walls were built and if our money was overflowing and we didn't know what to do with it all, we could, it'd be a good experiment. And the chairs were full. God still isn't done with us yet. There's a bigger problem, a larger issue. Because we're always in danger of going back to normal, the way we were, the way it was. And normal isn't good enough for God. God's reputation is at stake in this wall. That's the passage from Nehemiah 1. That's just why I had it. His name, his covenant, his promise is to look out for his people. And if his people are in disrepair, then something is wrong. And the questioning eyes turn to God. Why aren't they doing better? God can't be unfaithful to his promise and to his people because God isn't capable of being unfaithful. 2 Timothy 2, if we are faithless, don't believe God, don't believe what he says, if we behave badly, he nonetheless remains true because he cannot deny himself. You see, good isn't good enough for God. God's wall isn't good enough. There's one more thing. They were broken hearted.
heart in him when they heard what God expected. And they wept. And they wept. Because they know and knew that their hearts were hardened and they had become like their neighbors, cold and cynical and indifferent to the calling of God. And when they heard that, they broke down. And you think, oh, that's good. That's what really changed their lives. Okay, yes, it is, partly. But we're not done there yet either. Because Nehemiah said, go and enjoy the choice foods and sweet drinks that you have prepared for people who don't have anything also. The day is sacred to the Lord. Don't grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your what? Strength. What keeps a people pure? The joy of the Lord. What makes them strong? When they've come through this entire process, and at the end of the day, God says, you've repented. You love my precepts, right? Two requirements, love God, watch his precepts. You heard my precepts, you want to keep them and watch them, great. They repent with all their hearts and they want to come back to God. Nehemiah says, great. No, come back with the joy of the Lord. The people gather together they heard the word. They loved the word. They loved the precepts of God. And I think that's true of this congregation, isn't it? Amen. Right? That's Amen. why we're here. Amen. Doesn't matter if the sermon's great or just kind of ordinary, but you love the word of God. You don't, it doesn't matter who says it because it's the word of God. It's powerful because God says it. They loved God and they gathered together. What was different on that day? They solved the injustice, they solved the economy, they solved the one, no. Nehemiah says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. And for just a moment, I would like to say a little bit about the word, the joy of the Lord. See, we put that little expression on refrigerator magnets and we put it on the refrigerators. How many of you know somebody who has that on their refrigerator? Don't raise your hand. Okay, good. <laughs> it's a wonderful line. <clears throat> but you might think that that line means the joy of the Lord is your strength. Because that's what it says, right? And you might think, if as long as I'm happy, God's happy. And if I'm happy, I'm good. And if I'm happy, the world is good. You'd think that's what that word means. But that's not what that word means. It is a word, the joy, the word joy, this particular word, simchat, means when people get together and they praise God and they're enthusiastic. Of the 83 times that you can find it, and I can't hold my microphone up and do this, but see all these pages? These are all the 83 uses of this word. And I want to share a few of them with you to get what Nehemiah meant, what keeps his people strong, and what's going to keep us strong. In other words, I've been at this for a month, and here it is, the payoff for a month's worth of work, okay? Remember this all your lives. N Numbers 10. At the times of your rejoicing, there's the word, rejoicing, your appointed feasts and your new moon festivals, you sound the trumpets over the burnt offerings and the fellowship offerings. They will be a memorial before the Lord your God because I am the Lord your God. You get together, you blast the trumpets, you tell everybody that you love God and your heart is with God. You love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and you follow his precepts and God will hear and see you. That's what that rejoicing means. When the men were returning home, Isaiah 18, 6, after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out of the towns. They met him with singing and dancing with joyful songs. Now, they weren't just singing happy little songs. That's not the point that they were happy. Their hearts were torn and drawn to God with all their energy and all their being. 
David went around and he brought the ark up. We're not going to read all 83 of these, but I just wanted to get you the feeling. They came from Obed Eben to the city of David with rejoicing. That doesn't mean they were all just happy and telling jokes to each other. It meant their whole heart was turned in worship and praise of God. That's what keeps people strong. First Kings 140, the people went out playing their flutes and rejoicing greatly. The ground shook with a sound. That's what the word, the joy of the Lord, will make you strong means. It means that you gather together and you shake the place with songs of praise. First Chronicles 12, 40, David and the leaders appointed uh, uh, brothers and uh, singers to sing joyful songs and then other, again, I'll just read these. Jehoshaphat and all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem because the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemy. They came with singing. They came with all their energy turned to bless God. The songs that we know, um, I'm going to skip uh, some of these here. Just read that up. The redeemed of the Lord will return, and they will enter his gates with singing. And everlasting joy will be a crown on their heads. Gladness and joy twice now will overtake them, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. When God is present and the people turn and they look at God, their hearts go up and their lives are transformed, and they are never tempted to fall away at that time. I supervised community service workers in my uh, earlier career, and I had lots of people who belonged in jail, but they were out of jail so they could spend time with me. Many of them weren't sure which was worse. But I can tell you something I learned about people over the course of the years. You'll never commit, get a kid who's happy and rejoicing to commit a felony crime. They won't do it. They're way too smart because happy people don't do dumb things. Happy people do smart things. And that is their strength when they worship God. How will we be strong as a church? We will worship God. They will go out with joy. They will be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills burst forth in song and the trees of the field will clap their hands. And I could go on. But I promised it'd be short, and it is. I'm asking you, build the wall, seek justice, feed the poor, love your neighbors, all of that. Build the wall. But hear Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord, the worship of the Lord, hearing his law, obeying it, loving God, and dedicating your life to worship is your strength, and that's what keeps us. The rest of our service is dedicated to simply this. God is a God of a covenant. He made a promise to watch us and to hear us, to know our needs. He gave his son as our savior. And we ask you, come together. Let's renew our commitment. Let's renew this covenant with God and say, God, come rebuild us as we worship you. I've completely shredded my order of worship here. But Bob, would you 